Oh, I love it. I feel the love. I feel the love. Hey, will you give the Lord a shout of praise real quick? Come on, all over the room. Hey, also, will you join? We're in additional seating. Can we give a shout out to the additional seating? And then also all the other campuses, Katie, Cypress, Cornerstone is joining us as well. Hey, lift your hands towards heaven wherever you're standing. Father, I thank you today for the power of your spirit. Lord, we did not come for karaoke Sunday. We didn't come to just play church. The reward of this moment is not blessings. The reward of this moment is you. Blessings is a bonus because we're your kids. So God, unanimously in agreement today, I thank you that we have recognized that your presence is here. Jesus, you're walking up and down the aisles. And we're going to walk out the same doors we walked in, set free, healed, and delivered. God, show up, show off, throw your weight around the room, flex, do what only you can do. We give you praise now, in Jesus' name, amen. Hey, high five a couple people around you, and then you can be seated. Pastor Richie, that was amazing. Can you guys give Hope City Worship a huge hand as well? Man, y'all blessed me today. Hey, don't ever approach this casually. Don't ever come at this flippantly. Don't ever just assume this is happening everywhere. Heaven has started touching earth here four years ago, and Hope City has gotten caught in between, and it's amazing what God has been doing. If you have been changed, affected, influenced, you found hope because of Hope City, will you wave at me? Come on, all in this, amazing. Thank you for your overwhelming enthusiasm. Come on, has God been good to you? Cool. Pastor Jeremy said this a couple months ago, but over 30,000 people have committed their lives to Jesus the past four years here at Hope City. Y'all, that, somebody should shout, run around the room, like, praise break moment. That's amazing. 30,000 people that will never know what the sin of hell is like because two people said yes to the call of God on their lives. So you give Pastors Jeremy and Jennifer Foster a hand as well for saying yes to the call. So I am Pastor Daniel. I know Pastor Jeremy mentioned that on the video. How many of y'all have been in a service with me before? Wave at me. Cool. How many of you guys have no clue who I am? All right. Well, I'm white chocolate. All right. <laughs> In high school, I thought I was John B. How many of y'all remember John B? Mm -hmm, yeah, I know. <laughs> With the pinstripe beard and the hoops, and I only listen to Tyrese. <laughs> Lately, have I told you I love you? All right. All right, we're moving on. I don't have many regrets. I've been here now, um, it's like my 53rd time. Who's counting me? <laughs> but uh, I don't have many regrets. I told Pastor Jeremy, I said, I do wish four years ago I would have established myself here with a British accent. <laughs> and maybe a hairpiece with crunchy bangs. But, um, come on, you can laugh, it's Sunday, we're having, y'all woke up again today, we're breathing, which is proof that God's not done with you yet. My wife sends her love, she's watching right now with my kids, this is real time, this is what they look like every day, this is beautiful chaos, you're right there, okay. So my beautiful wife, no makeup, she said, babe, I have no makeup on, Fox is crying, this one made it in the pic, he's just happy to be here, and she's super photogenic. Give Jackie and the kids a hand, love my family. Well, I'm going to pray and we're going to jump in, but before we do, I just want to acknowledge, man, God has already been doing amazing things the past, what, three, four weeks of this summer revival. I mean, Pastor Jeremy is getting a much needed breather and he has set y'all up with some heavy hitters. I mean, week one was Pastor Jimmy Rollins. How many of y'all enjoy Pastor Jimmy Rollins? Man, he is a fire, firecracker. I mean, he's one of my best friends. Second, Pastor Daniel Floyd from Frederick, Fredericksburg, Virginia. How many of y'all enjoy Pastor Daniel Floyd? Amazing. Last week, my boy from Las Vegas, Jabin Chavez. Like, it's not what he says his name like, but that's the way I have to say it when I say his name. And then a few weeks before that, my stunt double, Josh Turner. How many of you guys enjoy Josh? We have like this public beef, but we're buddies. We talk every day. Um, so we're going to pray and we're going to jump in. Uh, God, today, I thank you that your word becomes alive in our hearts. I love that the Holy Spirit will meet us where we're at. God, meet people where they need courage. Meet people where they need joy. Meet people where they need hope today, and let your word come alive today in our hearts, in Jesus' name. I'm going to go in the direction of a summer challenge where all of us are invited, like this summer challenge where we all unanimously agree with that we're going to be a part of it. Now, I can tell body language has shifted, like, are we talking about like a weight loss challenge? Because I'm not doing a 5K for anybody. <laughs> no, I'm talking about a summer challenge that is this. Let's get our yes out of the way. Amen. One amen. I appreciate that. She said it with conviction, too. She's like, amen. <laughs> Let's get our yes out of the way so that when we wake up in the morning, we can look in the mirror and say, okay, God, I have my to-do list. I have my tasks. I'm raising my family. I'm living my life. But I'm going to get my yes out of the way today because there's healing in my hands. 
I'm going to get my yes out of the way today because I know that I'm going to encounter somebody or encounter someone's storm. And maybe I have what they need through the word of God to speak life into them. So everybody on the count of three across all campuses, additional seating in this room, say yes. One, two, three. Get your yes out of the way. And what does that mean? It simply means that you set yourself up to be the hands and feet of Jesus. This is what our foundation verse is starting off this morning. It's found in Romans chapter 10, verse 14 and 15. It says, but how can they call on him? We're talking about Jesus. To save them unless they believe in him. How can they believe in him if they have not heard about him? And how can anyone go and tell them without being sent? That's why the scripture says, how beautiful are the feet of the messengers who bring the good news. Now, I know there's somebody in the room right now, they're like, you had me for the whole thing until the beautiful feet. You've never seen my feet. <laughs> I know who you are. You got the little snaggle, little, little buddy on the end. And no matter how much you put it in and you paint it, ladies, and doctor it up, it still knocks things over and knocks little kids down. Like, <laughs> how beautiful are the feet of the messengers who tell and share the good news. Jesus said this in Luke chapter 2. Jesus made this statement that he was about his father's business. What is the father's business? The father's business is people. We're talking about people. It's like Alan Iverson. We're talking about practice. <laughs> Only no white people know what I'm talking about. On that. <laughs> we're, talking about pe we're talking about people. We're, we're talking about lives, eternity. We're talking about souls. We're talking about that loved one that you've been believing God to know Jesus. We're talking about that coworker who's ratchet and messy. We're talking about that neighbor who's broken. We're talking about people. I'm not, for those of you who just woke up, I'm not talking about at the hotel when the door, you know, room service comes in, you look through the peephole. I'm talking about, that's silly, I'm not gonna do that joke again. People, we're talking about people. The reason the Silos Project is so near and dear to the heart of this church is because of people. At Bellway 8 and I-10, the silo standing 120, 130 foot tall will soon have a Hope City sign across of it. Why? Because of people. People would drive by and that sign and that church, this movement, this moment, is gonna get in the way of people's storms. Jesus was about his father's business. I always encourage you, if you've been in services with me before, I encourage you to take notes it's really, really important to not just be a spectator, because if you're just a spectator, then you're just going to show up and walk out and be like, yeah, it was good. I mean, I scratched a to-do list box. Yeah, I went to church. But if you're a person filled with expectation, man, I encourage you, get your iPhone out, your eye device, borrow an eyeliner. If you have a droid, I apologize. I'm not sure what you're doing <laughs> with your life. Uh -huh. But write it down. Harvard did a study. Harvard Community College, right outside Branson. <laughs> Not the real Harvard. No, Harvard did a study that said that if you take down notes in real time, your retention rate goes up to 30% in the moment. If you take down notes and then you go back and reapply it and you maybe watch the live stream or you go back and watch it on YouTube, your retention rate goes up to 90 to 95%. But if you're a hearer only, you only receive about 5%. So write this down if you're taking down notes. Found people, find people. Found people, find people. See, I've been rescued. I never should have made it. A lot of you know my story about being born in an accident to an addict, alcoholic, wife-cheating, wife-beaten family, a Jerry Springer literally episode. <laughs> Messed up, messy. I never should have made it. And so when I was rescued and God showed up and pulled my dad out of a low place and he rescued him in the lowest place of his life, and he began to restore and heal my family, I can't help but shout from the rooftops of God's faithfulness and God's goodness and God's mercy and God's unfailing love. I can't help but shout about what he's done because I've been found, so I'm looking for other people that have not been found. So write that down. Found people, find people. And I'm fired up. I just got on preaching three straight nights in Denver, Colorado, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. I'm telling you, heaven touched earth there. We saw so many people saved. So many people healed. It was absolutely amazing. And something just began to stir in me that, man, the one standing with us and the one standing for us is so much stronger than the one that's been standing against us. And what God has been doing at Hope City, the hell that's been happening in people's lives is no match for the heaven that's inside of you guys and what God is wanting to do through you guys. Look at the person next to you and say, get ready. Come on, let them know. Say, get ready. This should fire you up today. Mark chapter 16, verse 15, New Living Translation. I love this. Translation says, and then he told them, go to all the world and preach the good news to everyone. Now, that all the world part, some people are like, well, Pastor Daniel, I'm not called to missions. Like, I'm never going to Uganda, okay? 
I'm not talking about missions. I'm talking about going to all the world. You can actually make this small. What's your world? What sphere of influence do you have? They say statistically you have the trust equity and the influence in about three people's lives. Is that your world? And are you preaching the good news? Are you reflecting Jesus to them? When you walk into a room, does the atmosphere shift because you walk in the room? Do people walk up and say, I don't know what it is about you, but I have peace around you. Fear seems to leave. See, when you're filled up with the word of God, what fills spills. Write this down if you're taking down notes. We are all called to go. All of us. Thank you for your overwhelming. Listen, if you're watching on live right now, this is not a room full of mannequins. They're just taking it in. No. <laughs> We're all called to go. Say go. go. The Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, and I'm just bringing some foundational validity to this because I want you to know that you're chosen. You're chosen by God, but you are the ones chosen by God. Chosen for the high calling of priestly work. Chosen to be a holy people. God's instruments to do his work and speak out for him to tell others of the night and day difference that he's made in you. Come on, just lift your hands right now. If he's made a night and day difference in you, from nothing to something, from rejected woo, to accepted. So we are all called to go. And you know, this whole Great Commission, go, be an influence, this isn't based upon an extroverted personality. This isn't based on your perfect oratory delivery. This isn't based upon your gifting. Paul actually said in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 4, in my message and my preaching, it was actually really plain. Rather than using clever and persuasive speeches, I love this, I relied only on the power of the Holy Spirit. We are all called to go. Next to go, would you just write get out? Why, why am I saying that? Get out of your comfort zone. You know, a comfort zone is just that. It's comfortable, but nothing ever grows there. So we're all called to go. Say go. Number two, we are all called to, and this shouldn't be a shock, we are all called to love. You know, as sons and daughters, as Christ followers, Christian meaning Christ-like, we should all be called to love. But here's the truth. We've kind of gotten in this mode across this country where we love based upon if we connect, or we love based upon skin color, or we love based upon, well, she was kind to me, or he was kind, so I'm going to be cool with, no, no, the Bible says to love everyone. This is what Jesus said in John 13, verse 34 and 35. And so I'm giving you a new commandment for you now. Love each other just as much as I love you. Your strong love, another translation says your compassionate love for each other will prove to the world that you are my disciples. We're all called to go. We're all called to love. I preached at this church last year and this lady came up to me and said, last time you were here, you talked about being sensitive to the Holy Spirit. And she said, I just... The whole service, I was just blown away. She said, I'm 71 years old. I've been going to church for 55 years, and I haven't felt the presence of God in over 50 years. She said, I've been going to church out of a routine. I mean, I've been singing songs just to sing them, and I'm, I'm faithful. But she said, I'm faithful to tradition, and I'm, honestly, I think I'm faithful to religious experiences. But she said, I haven't had this, this Holy Spirit moment. So she said, at 71 years old, I said, God, can you still use me? Like, I'm breathing. Can you still use my life? She said, now listen, don't pray those prayers. You know, we all ask for God to use us, but we refuse to take a step. So she said, I'm at Walmart, and I'm shopping, and I'm on my way out. And she said, I felt the Lord for the first time in over 50 years. Nudge my heart. Go give her a hug and tell her I love her. And she said, no, not me, God. I don't know her. That's the devil. I'm not going to do that. <laughs> she said she went out to her car, got it started, and she said, the Lord said, didn't you ask me? Didn't you ask me? You're breathing you woke up again today, didn't you ask me to use you? So she said, I got out of my car, reluctantly went back in. She said, this lady was in the car aisle, and she said, I was kind of like. <laughs> She's just kind of reading a card, acting like I'm reading it. <laughs> she opens the one with the dog, and it's like singing and moving it. And she said, she finally just put the card away and put her hand on the lady's shoulder, and the lady turned around, tears coming down her face. And she said, can I give you a hug? And before she could say hug, the lady fell in her arms. Ten minutes before, she's buying groceries, thinking the devil told her to go hug her, and now she's holding a stranger. The lady steps back and goes, well, why did you just come over here? She said, I'm not trying to be weird and, and super Christian, but God told me to come tell you these three things, that he loves you, to give you a hug, and that he sees you. And the lady said, no, you don't understand. Right before you walked up, I'm looking at all these cards. My husband died two months ago. 
And all these cards say Merry Christmas from the two of us, Happy Holidays from the both of us. And I looked up and said, God, do you even see me? I just need the proof, proof, I need your proof that you love me. And I just need a hug. And she said, before I could say hug, you touched my shoulder and said, can I give you a hug? That's how much God loves people. It's out of the overflow that you love people. So if you struggle with loving yourself, it's hard to love others. It says love your neighbor as yourself. That means you have to receive that love and then love others out of the overflow of the love that you've received as a daughter and a son. I think that we've gotten this messed up that we think that God's agenda is to do something for us, but the truth is his heart is to do something through us. I put this quote on my Instagram the other day that said, preach the gospel at all times, and when necessary, use words. Because the truth is, your life might be the only Bible that someone reads. So I'm gonna be super transparent. I've come here a lot. I'm family. I might be like a weird cousin, but I'm family. <laughs> With a fantastic beard. All right. That's all I have left. Give it to me. I'm like the opposite of Samson. God's like, I'm gonna remove your hair to keep you humble. I'm like, but God, you blessed me with this amazing beard. So, <laughs> all right. <laughs> so, it's so 8 o'clock the other night, or a few months ago, at 8 o'clock, doorbell rings, and we got a new baby and three other kids, and my wife's like, who's ringing the doorbell at 8 o'clock? I'm like, I don't know. She's like, go check. I'm like, so I go downstairs, and I open the door, and there's this super awkward kid, and he's like, hi there. <laughs> hey, um, hi, my name's Cody, and uh, I've noticed that your lawn is needing uh, treatment. And I go, bro, it's 8, it's 8, 8 05 at night. And you didn't ring the doorbell once, you rang it four times. Like, I almost hit you with a broom. Like, and I said, man, it's super late. I don't think my other neighbors are going to be cool with it. And he's like, I, sorry, man. I, and so I talked to him for a minute. And honestly, he kept interrupting me. And like, I started getting frustrated with him. Like, Cody, quit interrupting me. Like, you know what I mean? Like, you rang on my doorbell and now you're. And so I was getting a little fussy. And like, I could just tell like, okay, bro, I'm not interested. We obviously, our lawn's phenomenal. It's like a golf course. I don't need your spray. <laughs> I bid you farewell, sir. So I step back in the house, and my eight-year-old Finley's standing there like this. She goes, well, that wasn't very Christ-like. Because, you know, we practice what we preach on and off the stage. We teach our kids that we're called to go, that we're called to love. And I said, oh, really? You, have you brushed your teeth yet? Go. Just why are you talking to me like that? You're eight years old. So I go upstairs and I said, oh, babe, I feel really frustrated. And she said, what happened? I said, ah, oh, this guy came to the door. And she's like, yeah, what was it about? And I told her, I was like, I got a little fussy with him. And she's like, what do you mean? I said, I just, I don't know. Like, he kept interrupting me. And, and I could tell, it seemed like he was new. Like, he couldn't, literally couldn't tell me his name for the first seven minutes. And, and I said, I, I feel bad. I'll be right back. And she's like, what? I said, I'll be right back. And so I said to F Finley, come on, jump in my Rubicon. So we jumped in the, my Jeep and we were driving around the, if you're a Jeep fan, you notice I said Rubicon. <laughs> So I could have just said Jeep, but it's a Rubicon, all right. So, it's a Jeep thing, hashtag, all right. You would only know if you have one, okay. So we get in my Jeep and we're driving around with the windows down and I see him like walking door to door, it's pitch black out. And I said, hey Cody, and he's like, man, I'm sorry, I don't want any trouble. Like, and I'm like, Finley, jump on him like a spider monkey. Like, I didn't do that. So I rolled down the window and I said, hey man, and I got out of the car, I said, I, I just want to apologize. So I didn't represent uh, myself well and I didn't represent my God well. I said, you came to my house and honestly you threw me off with all the doorbells and, and all that stuff. <laughs> I said, but man, I just, and you know, I took 10 minutes with this guy and talked to him about looking people in the eye and sales approaches and said, man, I, I respect your hustle and your grind and I said, I actually want to bless you. And so I said, can you take any money? He's like, I don't know. I was like, just tuck it in your pocket. <laughs> Don't spend it in one place, Dollar Tree. And so, <laughs> and so I get back in the Jeep, and Finley goes, that's exactly what Jesus would have done. I said, all right. <laughs> Why'd you say that? You know, I believe, I said this a moment ago, that people's lives are attached to our destiny, and I'll never probably see that kid again. But Mark 6 talks about the parable of the sower. Like, I had an opportunity to do him wrong or do him right. The truth is, every single day, we have to be aware of who God places in our path. This kid needed encouraged. He shared with me that it was his first night out. He didn't think he was cut out for it. He got a side hustle job because he had a sickness in his family and he was trying to work to help them. And here me, one of his first stops, I'm yelling at him on my front porch. But that five spot helped him, bless the Lord. <laughs> All right, it was more than that. Okay, the Bible says in Colossians 3, 17, it says this. 
And whatever you do or whatever you say, you do it as a representative of Jesus Christ. So the moment you get saved, the, moments you, the moment you get your life right with God, and if you don't know him, I'm going to give you an opportunity at the end, but the moment you make things right with God and he comes in your heart, you now are representing the king of the world. You're now representing the creator of the universe. Now, we still are messy sometimes, and I know that we're flawed and we're human, but every day if we're growing in the things of God, the things that have been holding us captive, you begin to want to get away from, and you begin to grow more and more and begin to look more and more like Jesus. So I fly a lot, five planes in the last four days. So I was in Denver preaching, flew to Salt Lake City, and on my way here, I'm just, I love details, this is true. Right to the right of me, this guy is holding a dog the size of a Shetland pony. Like, you can go on my Instagram story and see it. And he's reading his Kindle, and this dog is just lying out, just licking his face and getting him in the mouth. Just white people stuff, you know, just, uh, uh, I just can't take it. Like, like, literally, the lady next to me, her and I were having a moment, like, look at this guy. Uh, like, uh, just in the whole deal. In the... So I encounter a lot of people on planes, carnies and everything else. And so... A few months back, I'm sitting at one of the gates in Atlanta, and I like to people watch. So I'm tired. I just preached at a conference, and I'm watching people like, okay, I'm looking at my app. There's nobody still on the app, nobody sitting next to me. Like, this is a bonus. If you fly, this is a big deal. Like, I can put my whole leg on that seat. I can do whatever I want. I can lay on it. Whatever I need to do, it's right there. And so uh, I'm looking around. This guy's like, oh, like coughing his head off. I'm like, God, I just pray. Pray for healing with the brother with the bird flu. I pray, God, that he does not come any near me. Give him a mask, God. Show him a higher. And so I'm looking around. We get on the plane, like, and it's, this is amazing. Like, nobody is sitting in the seat. The whole plane is full except the favor of the Lord. <laughs> God said, you've done well, my son. I'm going to give you this seat. That's not true. So this guy walks on the plane who I had passed earlier who had the largest dive from cup I'd ever seen. Like, I didn't even know you could find those. He must have packed it in his own little carry-on like 185 ounces of just whatever, and this massive bag of to-go food. And sure enough, before the lady shuts the door, here he comes. And I'm looking back like, oh. And he just plops down, and I'm like, I'm like, hey, how you doing? He's like, Ooh. yeah, yeah, kept it warm for you. The bag's right there. I'm glad you're sitting next to me, all right. And, and he's, what was that? I'm kind of a talker. Oh, yeah, okay. All right. Uh-huh, yeah, okay, good. yeah, okay, okay, sure, yeah, bless you, okay, what, okay, what, it's like, I hope you don't mind me eating this, and I said, no, it's a free country, like, it's the beautiful thing about the United States, so, all right, bless you, and so I just kind of lean over, this is not exaggerated at all, I wake up out of a dead sleep to the most insane attacking of a sandwich, his arms are like this, he's going crazy, it's flaky, it's, it's a four foot radius of pastry. It's all over him. No joke, it's all over me. Like, it's all over me. Pesto mayo on the lip, like, I'm like, what is this? He's sharing his lunch with me and I didn't even ask for it, it's a forced blessing. <laughs> so I'm, I'm tired, I just got him preaching a whole week and so I'm like, bro, like, what is happening right now? And he's like, it's kinda messy, it's a croissant wedge. I'm like, I have never heard of this. It's a true story. So, you know, in our humanity, we have a choice to make. This guy's bothering me. Like, whoo, can you move this guy? Can you pepper spray him? What are you allowed to do as a flight attendant? You're prepared for this? Like, and I'm literally just frustrated. Like, how dare this guy? It's all over me. Got all over my off-whites. I was wearing Crocs probably at the time, to be honest. So I just kind of like, okay, and he's like, sorry, it's kind of all over me. He's brushing me, now he's assaulting me? <laughs> like, sir, you don't have to touch me? So I'm like, okay, you're good. You're good, thank you. All right, and so I lean back over, and I heard the Lord say, what if I put you here next to him? That's kind of a wake-up call moment. Call to go, call to love, call to be a representative of Jesus. Was I looking like Jesus? Mm-mm. So I took my headphones off. I said, well, you, you woke me up. He's like, well, good, now we can talk. I said, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's exactly what I've wanted, you and me to just talk. You know, in about 10 minutes, I said, man, what's your story? Where are you from? Where are you flying? He said, I'm flying uh, to just get away. My wife, um, my wife cheated of uh, 30 years. My wife cheated on me with my best friend. 
he said, kick me out of the house and took my dog and took everything I had. And he said, I've, I've never been a depressed person. I've never had anxiety issues. And he said, I've, I've thought about suicide more times than I wish I could. I'm struggling. I'm struggling. I'm really, really. I don't know why I'm telling you all this. And I knew why. You know, we've gotten in this bad mode, I think, where we say things like, oh, you're going through hell on earth. Okay. Hashtag praying for you. Oh, okay. What if we actually prayed for them? I said that a moment ago, but what if we actually took the moment, in the moment at 6A and 6B on this Delta flight, I actually said, what's your name? I'm going to pray for you right now. And I believe God's going to touch this right now at 35,000 feet. I believe he's going to do stitches where you've been putting a Band-Aid and peace is going to overtake your heart and hope is going to flood this plane and God is going to move in your life. See, I would have, in my flesh, wanted an open seat, but over a period of an hour, I'm sitting there praying for this guy, never to see him again, but that's probably the only Jesus that he saw that week. We have to start seeing people the way God sees them and not be so quick to judge them based upon the chapter of their life that you walked in on. But she clearly is messy. Look how broken she is. This lady came up to me, no joke, came up to me and said, I hear you, but you don't know the work environment I work in. It's really bad. I mean, people say full sentences with just swear words. I mean, chain smoke outside, it's just awful. People smell like the world. I smell like the glory, and I smell like anointing oil. I said, no, ma'am, you smell like pride. Because the truth is, what if God sent you on an assignment to reach those messy, messy, smell like the world people? What if you're the only Jesus that they see? We're all called to go. We're all called to love. And then the last one, write this down. We're all called to be the church. Now, I know, again, this is fundamental stuff that we can take away with us. But we're called to be the church. The Bible refers to the church as the body of Christ. We all make up the church. Our gifts, our strengths make up this thriving community called Hope City. Write this down if you're taking down notes. A church united together is what the enemy is terrified of. A church united together is what the enemy is terrified of. Why? Because he knows you're dangerous. Why? Because he knows there's healing in your hands. Why? Because I believe that when we do it together, we can truly change a region. Romans chapter 12, verse 4 says it this way. In this way, we are like various parts of a human body. Each part gets its meaning from the body as a whole, not the other way around. The body we're talking about is Christ's body of chosen people. Each of us finds our meaning and function as a part of this. But a chopped off finger or cut off toe wouldn't amount to much, would it? So since we find ourselves fashioned into all these excellently formed and marvelously functioning parts in Christ's body, let's just go ahead and be what we're made to be without enviously or pridefully comparing ourselves with each other or trying to be something that we aren't. Here's the truth. Not everybody's called to the worship team, but you may make a mean cup of coffee. Not everybody is called to children's ministry, especially if you're a weirdo. Like, we're not gonna let that happen. But you can greet, you can be a part of the load-in team, you can be part of the ushers. There is room for you. If you've been sitting on the sidelines, if you've been wondering, is there room for me? Is there something I can do? It's a resounding yes. So when you get your yes out of the way and recognize that God has something amazing to unlock in you through the local church, it's the heartbeat of heaven. I'm gonna echo what Carla said earlier on July 13th. Say July 13th. July 13th. It's serve day. There are gonna be projects happening all over the city. And whether you just joined the church or you're planning on it or you've been here and you're a, se a seasoned saint, you've been here for a long time, there's something for every one of us to do. We can't all do everything, but we can all do something. You can check it out at hopecity.com slash serve. Download the Serve Day app to sign up. I remember the story of this little girl. It was a storm that stirred up the ocean and started throwing all these starfish on the beach. So her parents were there and she ran out on the beach and she said, Mom, look at this, there's starfish everywhere. And the parents were just like, I know, I know, come on. This little girl began to run frantically and grab one and throw it back in the ocean and run and grab another one and throw it in the ocean and run and grab another one. And here's some smooth, you know, Jean-Claude Van Damme looking Panama Jack guy walked by and he's like, can't save all of them. And she goes, yeah, but I can save this one. And, and I can save this one. And we can't all do everything, but we can do something. And when you all do something, man, it does some serious damage to the kingdom of darkness. We have to stop comparing, though. I wish I had gifts like him. I wish I had gifts like her. And I'm sure if we reverse it, there's gifts you have that we wish we had of yours. Write this down if you're taking down notes. We won't be distracted by comparison if we are captivated by purpose. You will no longer be distracted by comparison if you're captivated by purpose. 
Pastor Jeremy said something back in December that fired me up. I'm telling you, I'm sitting, I can't remember where I was preaching. I was preaching on the West Coast, and I watched the service, and he began to tell about the Silos Project. How many are excited about the Silos Project? I'm telling you, this will be a game-changing God moment for this city, but not only this city, this region, but I believe globally what God is about to release is going to absolutely double the church, bring a ridiculous amount of people home to Jesus. I believe it's going to be absolutely phenomenal. But he began to cast this vision and unapologetically said, man, I want everybody to be involved. Whether you have a little bit or you have a lot, get involved. If you can give now, give. If you can't, you can pledge. And I remember my wife and I, we went right online. I said, we're going to give now. So we sowed in that moment. And then I said to my wife, I said, I think we should pledge. And so the, the amount that we talked about was a stretch of faith. It's audacious. But we went ahead and said, we're going to do it. We're going to pledge. Why? Because of people. Why? Because we believe that this is going to be a restoration center, a house of miracles, a place where people can show, walk in, and during the countdown, a tumor would disappear, and cancer would disappear, and their life would be completely transformed. A house of miracles and a house of worship. And because this house is built on a house of generosity, July 10th, say July 10th, July 10th. closing date on the property. How amazing is that? Because a pretty good size of a percentage has come in towards the down payment, and there's still more to come. And if you pledge, thank you. If you put your seed in the ground already, amazing. If you pledge and you're saying, I'm still believing God for all the resources to come, we're praying that every dime comes in so that you can sow towards your commitment. If you have not given, I want to encourage you to spend time with the Lord. Take a couple moments with God and say, God, what would you have me do? And then just simply obey and do what he's asked. You can actually go to hopecity.com silos. And you can give or commit a pledge right there online. Because again, we're all called to go. We're all called to love. We're all called to be the church. And when you take ownership and it becomes yours, you want to put some seed in the ground. Because you know that the harvest that's going to come back, yeah, it's going to bless you and your family. But it also is going to result in thousands of people that will never experience what hell is like. Would you stand to your feet as we bring this in for a landing? couple quick little ending moments. My senior year of high school, I, I had an awakening with God. I stopped going to church because my parents made me, and I actually encountered Jesus for the first time at a conference. The Lord called me to do evangelism through worship. I remember I was 18 years old, evangelism through worship. He said, your gift will make room, but all you'll simply be doing is getting in the way of people's storms and pointing them to me, because it's the goodness and love of God that draws a man's heart to a place of freedom. Walking down the hallway, I played basketball. I was going to go overseas and play right out of high school. Y'all didn't know I had it like that. <laughs> All right. So I'm walking down the hallway, and I had stayed with, to myself, and I had kind of clicked off with, you know, the basketball team and my friends. But I walked by this kid who I'd never seen before, and I just kind of tapped him on the shoulder. I said, what's up, bro? And he turned around like, hey, man. And I said, are you coming to the game tonight? And he said, uh, no. It, it wasn't like, no, nah, I don't think so. It was like, no. And I said, well, you should. It's a big game. Like, college scouts are going to be there. It's like a big deal. I said, I'm going to put up seven threes, come on. <laughs> and he was like, I don't know what you're talking about. I was like, all right. So I said, you should come to the game. And he's like, no, thanks. And it was like real closed. And I said, bro, come sit with us. Like, he's like, you want me to come sit with you? I said, yeah, are you new here? And he's like, I've been going to school with you since the sixth grade. I'm like, what's up, bro? <laughs> I, know. I remember you were at the pool party, no? Okay. And I said, uh, well, man, come to the game. I think it's going to be amazing. This kid ended up being one of the funniest kids I'd ever met. Like, we had a blast. We all wished that we would have hung out with him our whole senior year. So years go by. My wife and I are walking through a mall in Tulsa called Woodland Hills, and this guy walks up. He's a little kind of jacked, and he's got a beard and longer hair, and he's like, you know when you don't know somebody, and they walk up to you, and they're like, hey, and they know you by name. And you're like, what's up, guy? <laughs> hey, pal. Like, I, he goes, you don't remember me. And he said something that was loaded. It was, it was quite the most loaded statement I've ever heard. He said, bro, you saved my life. And I'm like, I was like, summer camp lifeguard. <laughs> so I was like, we didn't do the mouth to mouth thing though, right? Like, I, did I pull you out of the pool? He's like, no. And he began to tell the story from his perspective. He said, what you don't know is I was standing in the hallway my senior year. It was a big game that night. And I was standing at the locker and I said, you're invisible. You're a ghost, you're a shadow. No one cares that you're alive. No one would even attend your funeral. Rod, this is almost over. He said, no one knows that I exist. And he said, before I could say exist, you hit me on the shoulder and said, bro, you should come to the game tonight. So what you don't know is you knocked me off the course that I was on. You knocked me out of the trajectory of my 
path that I was on. And so what you don't know is I was going home. I had planned it. My mom was out of town. My dad wasn't there. I had written a note. I put it on my mom's dresser. I was killing myself that night. So the game it took me out of what my rhythm was going to be, which was destructive, and it was going to end up a tragedy. And end up, uh, Daniel, you saved my life. It, it, I, I've, gone to, I've gone to college. I'm the first college graduate in my family. I, I'm going to Bible college right now. Like, God showed up through just your simple gesture. See, we get in the way of people's storms, but I could have just dismissed him. How many people do we walk by every day and God's saying, tell her I love her? How many people are we walking by every day and God's saying, just pray for them? How many people do we walk by every day because we're called to go love and be the church and we dismiss them because we're too busy or too distracted? Close your eyes with me if you don't mind. God, I pray that this sermon this weekend would begin to stir in our hearts Lord, just a healthy conviction that says that we're the hands and feet of Jesus. We're, we're getting our yes out of the way, and we want, just lift your hands, would you, just for a minute? I thank you, Lord God, that you're placing healing in our hands. That your word is on our lips, that you're beginning to give us boldness and courage and confidence, God. I pray, Holy Spirit, that you're at work and that you're moving right now in the hearts of every single person. God, I pray today for hope. Any area of our life that does not have hope is under the influence of a lie. So I pray, God, that whatever the enemy has been trying to do, I pray the assignment of the enemy to assassinate the destiny of people in this room and our additional campuses, additional seating, any area of their life, I'm gonna say it again, that feels hopeless, is under the influence of a lie. And I pray, God, right now that you'd begin to meet them where they're at. Thank you, Lord God, that you would ignite a fire, a passion in us and compassion for others. If you can put your hands down with your eyes closed just for a moment if you're here and you say, Pastor Daniel, here's the truth. I don't know Jesus as my savior. I have been out of church. Maybe you've never been to church. Maybe you're like my dad who showed up a drug addict and an alcoholic and a wife beater and a cheater. Maybe you showed up for ch to church one time and got saved and set free, healed and delivered. Maybe you're here and you say, Pastor Daniel, I don't know Jesus. I walked in here because somebody invited me. Maybe they told you they were gonna buy you a steak and you didn't know it was a steak chalupa. Taco Bell, you have a $3 limit. But you showed up. Maybe something in your heart's been convincing you tonight, today, I, I, just, I need to get things right with Jesus today. Or maybe you're the other invitation. You say, Pastor Daniel, I knew him once, but I've fallen away. I've gotten caught up in the prodigal life, and I've not been walking with him. But today's the day. Whether you're at Arcady, Cypress, Cornerstone, or additional seating, or you're in this room in West Houston, today's the day where everything shifts. You can go. You can love. You can truly be the church and God can unlock and ignite purpose in you today. So if you're here and you say, Pastor Daniel, you're talking about me. In just a moment, I'm gonna count to three and we won't embarrass you. We never do that here at Hope City. But I want you to just take a step out of your comfort zone and say, you're talking about me. So when I hit three, just lift up your hand. Nobody's gonna harass you or bother you. Nobody's gonna put anything in your hand. This is just a public acknowledgement of you're talking about me. One, I wanna get my life right with God. Two, I wanna rededicate. Three, if that's you, lift your hand right now. Hands going up all over the room. All over the room, people are lifting their hand right now. Amazing, amazing. Anybody else, just slip up your hand. You're talking about me. I just wanna get things right with God today. Amazing. You can put your hands down. From our team on the stage to our TV truck in the parking lot, we're all gonna pray this prayer together. We do not pray prayers at Hope City for symbolic reasons. We pray because Romans 10, verse nine and 10 says this. Confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus Christ is Lord and you will be saved. Your pastor raced, thrown as far from the east as, as it is to the west, never to be thrown in your face again. Jesus is gonna come in and heal and restore you today. Well, everybody pray this prayer across all campuses, additional seating and in this room. Say this with me, Jesus, it's me. My life isn't working because I don't have you. I lay every mistake, every burden, every one of my sins at your feet and I ask for your forgiveness. From this day on, I commit to live for you, and I confess you now as my Father, my Savior, and my Lord. Thank you for not giving up on me when I've given up on myself. Thank you for not giving up on me when I was at my lowest. I'll love you forever, in Jesus' name, amen. Come on, Hope City, will you rejoice along with heaven? Now, come on, you can shout better than that. Lives transformed, hearts healed.